Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast on the internet where each season we select six movies based on a single theme, and then in each episode, we pick one of those movies and give you behind-the-scenes information on how the movie was made and why the movie was made. And huh? This movie was made? It's full of fun facts and some unfun facts and some, you know, neutral facts. And possibly some stuff we accidentally made up and just got wrong. Now, after about 15 minutes of movie history and insights, you get a full review of the film by me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell. We're right in the middle of season 21's theme, right in the middle with you, featuring six movies all based on the writings of Michael Crichton, both novels and original screenplays. This is episode three, and we're reviewing the movie Timeline, a movie that conceptually is about time travel. But I don't think that's the movie's point, and I've seen it twice. Let's not waste any more time discussing the past. Instead, travel with me into the future at the steady rate of one second per second until we meet our final destination, the end of this episode. Bo, get in here and tell us all about how the adaptation of Michael Crichton's novel Timeline in the past so it can impact the future discussion of this movie later in the future of this episode. <sighs> what time is it? We're talking a lot this season about Michael Crichton, and rightfully so. The whole season's about him, after all. But when talking about this episode's movie, Timeline, the thing that's most interesting about it is its director, Richard Donner. If the name sounds familiar, it should. Donner directed movies for four decades, and in that time manages to make some of the best action films of those decades, along with helming franchises and even a classic horror movie. So before we get into the miserable movie that is Timeline, let's take a moment to celebrate its director, who made far better movies than this one, Richard Donner. Born Richard Donald Schwartzberg in New York City in 1930, young Richard was born to parents of Russian Judaism ancestry. His father was a successful businessman who owned a furniture manufacturing business, while his mother stayed home to take care of young Richard and his sister Joan. Furniture manufacturing doesn't seem like fuel for the creative fire that led to Donner's love of film. For that, you had to go to Donner's grandfather, who owned a movie theater in Brooklyn. Donner would see movies at his grandfather's theater and at a very young age, developed an intense and lasting fascination with moving images. Originally though, Donner was not interested in being behind the lens. He wanted to be one of those larger than life figures on the big screen. He was gonna be an actor. World War II was just over when Donner graduated from high school and he found his way into the Navy where he became an aerial photographer. Once his time was up in the Navy, he decided to attend college and enrolled at New York University where he pursued an education in acting and drama. After only a short time in college, Richard Schwartzberg adopted the stage name Richard Donner and headed west to try his luck in Los Angeles. There, he met a director named Martin Ritt, who directed his way through a roster of early 50s television shows. Ritt would later go on to direct the Paul Newman films HUD and Ombre, among other films. Donner showed up as an actor on one of those television sets where Ritt served as director and suggested Donner might want to try his hand at directing instead of working as an actor. Ritt was so convinced Donner had a talent for it, he hired Donner as his assistant. After getting some experience alongside Ritt, Donner was hired onto the staff of Desilu Productions, the company owned and run by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. He directed commercials for the company, but by the late 50s, Donner was now sitting in the director's chair on real deal television shows, especially serial westerns of the time. He directed Steve McQueen in Wanted Dead or Alive and Chuck Connors in The Rifleman, which still boasts one of the best intros in television history. Seriously, look it up on YouTube. It rocks. Donner directed everything from The Fugitive to Get Smart to Gilligan's Island to the classic Twilight Zone episode Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, which would later be reimagined by George Miller in the Twilight Zone movie. By the time the early 60s rolled around, 
Donner was ready to venture into feature films. His first would be a dramatization of the NASA X-15 rocket program, called, appropriately enough, X-15. The film starred Charles Bronson and Mary Tyler Moore. That movie didn't exactly rocket up the box office charts that year, and Donner was back working in television for the next seven years. His next foray into theatrical features was a movie starring Sammy Davis Jr. and Peter Lawford. You know Sammy Davis Jr. from being Sammy Davis Jr., and you might know Peter Lawford for having starred in The Longest Day or The Picture of Dorian Gray in the 1940s. In the film, titled Salt and Pepper, Lawford and Mr. Davis Jr. were co-owners of a club named Charles Salt and Chris Pepper, hence the title. Also, one was white and one was black, but not the ones you think. See, Sammy Davis Jr. was Salt and Lawford was Chris Pepper, very clever Hollywood in the 1960s. That also did not burn up the box office despite being a groovy mystery, and so Donner returned to television yet again. The third time would prove to be the charm for Richard Donner. In 1976, he directed The Omen. While it was largely a film made on account of William Friedkin's The Exorcist being such a hit and the ensuing popularity of, you know, the devil, Donner was working with luminaries like David Warner and Gregory Peck. R.I.P. the recently departed David Warner, by the way. Spoilers, his decapitation in The Omen is amazing. And the baboon attack is worth the price of admission alone. Donner originally wanted The Omen to be a little bit more ambiguous, so that when Gregory Peck finally gets around to attempting to murder his child, the audience isn't quite sure if Peck is murdering the Antichrist or just some poor kid. The producer, David Seltzer, put the kibosh on that idea in favor of doing a more straightforward horror film, and the rest is box office history. The Omen fell into the top 10 films of the year and made Donner a bankable feature film director. So let's step back in time for just a minute. In 1973, Ilya Salkine decided he wanted to do an adaptation of Superman. From the beginning, the idea was to film that movie and its sequel back to back. And the list of directors interviewed for this job is insane. Francis Ford Coppola, William Friedkin, George Lucas, Sam Peckinpah, the latter director discounted after he brought a gun to one of the production meetings. After Jaws, Steven Spielberg was offered the director's chair for Superman the movie, but he had already committed to his alien movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. After lots of development, The Omen opened, putting Donner on the short list of directors to bring Superman to life, and he was eager to try his hand. The production of the movie is more than we have time for here, as it is a story unto itself, but Donner and the Salkinds, producers and owners of the rights to Superman, or at least the film version of those rights, did not get along. They were constantly angry at Donner for the cost of the film and the extended shooting time, forgetting the fact that they were making two movies at the same time. Richard Lester, who would eventually get director's credit on Superman 2, was brought in as a producer to mediate between Richard Donner and the Salkinds, who were no longer on speaking terms. Lester had his own problems with the Salkinds, who hadn't paid him for the version of the Three Musketeers he did for the producers. He was currently suing them in a number of countries, one for every time the Salkinds moved their money to a new territory. When Lester appeared on the set of Superman the Movie, Donner told Lester that he didn't trust him, and Lester said, I'm only doing this because they're paying me the money they owe me from the lawsuit. I will never come onto your set unless you ask me, and if I can help you in any way, call me. He also said, somewhat apocryphally, that he was there to warn Richard Donner not to ever work for the Salkinds again, and he expected that Richard Donner would be the next person to tell a new director, don't ever work for the Salkinds. As production went on, the Salkinds changed tactics. They ceased filming the sequel and concentrated on getting the first movie out the door, despite the fact that Superman 2 was 75% complete. Donner then finished Superman the movie, and it was released in 1978, and it was a massive hit. However, the Salkinds had no interest in continuing to work with Richard Donner, who they viewed as problematic. Richard Donner, in turn, thought the Salkinds were crooks, and eventually Richard Lester 
was tapped to complete the shooting of Superman 2, or at least the remaining 25%. Still, with both The Omen and Superman the movie under his belt, Richard Donner was a star director. After that, he tried his hand at a heady drama, Inside Moves, which proved to be critically successful, if not financially. Then he directed The Toy, starring Richard Pryor as a black guy that is hired by a rich white guy, played by Jackie Gleason, a movie we have not done on this show because it may be too hot for even us to handle. And then he directed Lady Hawk, a fantasy starring Rutger Hauer, Matthew Broderick, and Michelle Pfeiffer, which I think is quite good. But it wasn't until 1985's The Goonies that he scored another box office hit. And then the run of movies he went on beginning with The Goonies is remarkable. The Goonies was followed by 1987's Lethal Weapon, a stellar action film that cemented the fame of Mel Gibson, God help us all, and brought, I'm getting too old for this shit, into the popular vernacular. That was followed by Scrooged, my personal favorite Christmas film, then the rare superior sequel, Lethal Weapon 2 then Radio Flyer and Lethal Weapon 3, it really wasn't until 1994's Maverick that he had his first real dud in almost a decade, and he still managed to make reasonably popular movies all the way to 2006, including Assassins, Conspiracy Theory, and 16 Blocks. He also served as one of the executive producers and occasional director for the terrific Tales from the Crypt series, on HBO and produced movies ranging from Any Given Sunday to X-Men to Lost Boys. Donner passed away in 2021, and while he might never have been known for the most artistic of films, he knew how to make a solid popcorn summer action flick that could appeal to kids and adults alike. And on a personal note, I still think Superman the movie is at the top of the list for best superhero films of all time, and The Omen is still great Hollywood horror, not to mention the pure fun of the Lethal Weapon series, especially those first couple of films. And so how does a director like Richard Donner make an utter misfire like Timeline? Well, let's get into it. After lots of film success, Michael Crichton gave up the rights to Timeline for free. That's right, not one red cent. His condition was that whomever took the director's chair must use his screenplay and it must enter production right away. His reasons aren't entirely clear, though it may be that his declining health inspired him to push for the film, or it could be, or it could be the back-end deal he had for a share of the profits, or some combination of those two. Whatever the reason, his script was married to veteran director Richard Donner, and it seemed like a match made in popcorn heaven. A great airport novel writer, and a great Hollywood director. Only Donner felt the film needed a bit more exposition, and so contracted other screenwriters to take a swing at the adaptation. Eventually, he got a script he liked, and the movie was going before the cameras. In a head-scratching casting decision, Paul Walker was tapped to play the lead. He was riding high on the success of The Fast and the Furious a year before filming began, and despite the star's hot hand, sincerity and good acting was never his strong suit, and his performance does the film few favors. The rest of the cast is a solid, if uninspired, slate of casting. Gerard Butler was mostly a bit player in movies like Reign of Fire and Shooters, his most recognizable lead role prior to Timeline being the dreadful Dracula 2000. Frances O'Connor plays Kate, and she had an extensive resume, and you can still find her in some prestige dramas on television. But she never became a recognizable star. Our physicist in the film, Josh, was played by Ethan Embry, who horror nerds like me may know as the lead in The Devil's Candy from a few years back, but he's another working actor who has worked steadily before and since Timeline fell into his lap. The Professor is embodied by Glaswegian comedian Billy Connolly, who is a terrific stand-up and luminous soul. He worked as a welder before finding a career in performing, and has turned in dramatic and comedic performances alike, and I genuinely love the guy. Our villains are led by David Thewlis, an actor who is always brushed against greatness, but manages to skirt worldwide fame, but still delivers really solid performances as a rule. He's Doniger, and his second-in-command is Kramer, a role Matt Craven seems born for. He's second build in movies ranging from Crimson Tide to A Few Good Men, and is always competent, if not very, very good. There are lots of great actors surrounding the ones I mentioned. Martin Sheen as Lord Oliver, Anna Friel as Lady Claire, Neil McDonough as Frank Gordon, 
Aside from the surfer dude vibes of Paul Walker, the cast is kinda stacked. When the filming was done, Timeline came in at a whopping 2 hours and 16 minutes. Donner's film began with an extensive prologue describing Billy Connolly's journey to the past and setting up the film, not to mention that that cut was scored by Jerry Goldsmith in one of his last compositions before he sadly died. Unfortunately, Paramount, the production company and studio releasing the movie, was less than pleased with the very long and convoluted film, so they asked for a recut, which Donner did. This pushed the release of the movie from fall 2002 to March 2003, but Donner made his cuts and turned in draft two of Timeline. This was also rejected, and Paramount wanted the whole prologue cut, and Goldsmith was asked to come back in and rescore this new version of the film. Unfortunately, his health prevented him from coming back, and so his score was supplemented by another composer to work around the new flow of the movie, a guy named Brian Tyler. And of course, this pushed back the release of Timeline even further into 2003. When the movie was finally released by the studio, it was a critical and financial flop. Variety said of the film that it, quote, lacks the consistent tone, pace, and point of view for either a science fiction thriller or a medieval war adventure. That seems pretty generous to me. Also, the whole movie made about $40 million, and after extensive recuts and an expensive shoot to begin with, the movie was a bit of a flop. Crichton himself was so disappointed with the results of this movie version of Timeline, he never sold another piece of fiction for film adaptation again during his lifetime. It wasn't until after he died that Steven Spielberg optioned another work of his. But can it really be as bad as all that? For that answer, let's get our resident time travel expert in here to talk about how this movie disappoints in almost every possible way. Ladies and gentlemen, laddies and lassies, it's 2003's Timeline. Welcome back to this official discussion of the slam bang action film <laughs> timeline. Is it official? It may be an unofficial. I don't think this has been sanctioned by the Time Travel Motion Picture Association of Geeks and Nerds. You know, here's the thing that's interesting <laughs> is what a lot of regular listeners may know about you and I certainly do is that you like a good time travel movie. I love time travel movies. Back to the Future 1, I have seen an embarrassing number of times. It's over 100, it easily. 2 and 3, they're up there. I love mm -hmm. Bill and Ted, 1 and 2. I never saw that third one, but I should. 12 Monkeys, mm -hmm. I love the movie about time. That's a delightful time travel movie. It is quite good, yeah. Looper, it got a little complicated, but it's all right. Mm -hmm. Are Groundhog's Day and Edge of Tomorrow, are those time travel movies? Uh, if... I, kind of? You can, yeah, I mean, in mm. the sense, uh, that more of a Groundhog Day movie, I think, is, it's not quite time travel, it's more being stuck in a time, and yeah. the, like, because you have that, you have Happy Death Day falls into that category. Is it strange that in our lifetime, a movie genre was created? No, I don't think that's strange, because it happens all the time. I can't think of time. another one. I suppose that's true, but there was a time when the Western wasn't a genre, and then it was, or mob movies. That wasn't in our lifetime. No, but we also had the invention of computers, like one of the most seismic changes in the history of humanity. So we get all the good stuff. But as a form of storytelling, because I, I remember in a, a literary class that I took in my formative years where a professor talked about that, was it Robert Louis Stevenson's Robinson Caruso uh -huh. was a book that was written that didn't have any precedent for that framework of a story of a person being isolated alone. I was like, well, I, I'd never thought about that, but... By the way, Daniel Defoe is the writer of Robinson Crusoe. Just scrap all of that. Yeah. Clearly, I didn't learn anything <laughs> in school. Yeah. But we also <laughs> saw, within our lifetimes at least, the summer blockbuster was invented. Was it invented or did it just happen? Eh, I mean, well, yeah, I don't think it was intentional, but it did happen. The Marvel movies and all of that stuff would not exist without Jaws. So that happened within our timeline, if you will. 
Yeah. You know what else happened in our lifetime was the invention of those plastic dolls that weirdos have sex with. Oh, the real doll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, we've seen the best of times and the worst of times. What a glorious age it is to be alive, Bo. Yeah, I mean, you have opportunity to do literally anything. The downside is you can do literally anything. <laughs> Such as make a movie like this, which I would argue, Chad, a prime contender for worst of the season is this worse than congo yes i'm gonna have to ponder that let me give you one reason this is worse than congo let's hear it congo at least has a talking gray monkey. monkey well a talking monkey yes a, a monkey with a talking backpack also gray monkeys that cannonball into lava which gets a genuine laugh out of me and at no point in timeline am i entertained no i, I think you could argue that paul walker in this movie is the equivalent of a talking monkey but we'll get to that let me also say here's what you need to make a decent time travel movie at a bare oh. minimum all right filmmakers take note because i've seen a lot of them you need to have people that travel in time where their actions impact the future or at the very least elevate elements of the narrative because you did this in the past this is what happened in the future and it matters Bo this movie does none of that mm -hmm. aside from time travel being the way to get people from the early 2000s to the 1300s mm -hmm. time travel means nothing in this movie there's one moment where you get into time travel stuff in this film of like oh you can't do that because then this won't have happened in the future the glasses the glasses and the the <laughs> parchment yeah yeah there is a sense of if this movie didn't have like it, it's the the time loop right all of this was sort of predestined because all of the stuff that happens is stuff that had to happen for the past to occur in a way for them to see the stuff that they saw when the excavation was happening. Right. So if you're someone who has seen Back to the Future at one and two, this movie essentially is the parallel to, like, if you showed the Back to the Future trilogy, but you started the movie when Marty McFly shows up to the alternate 1985 in the middle of part two. Everything that happened in one and then the beginning of two were just assuming all of this happened and it don't really matter to the story we're telling i would argue this is almost a waste of time it, well that but a, it, like <laughs> a, a bill and ted s thing of like oh i'm gonna put this thing here so we'll have it but in bill and ted that's clever and it arguably yeah. makes sense in this movie and we'll get into it there are moments where everything they set up in the present then when they go in the past like oh i did this but it doesn't matter none of it matters the things that yeah. they pay off if the inciting incident wasn't so much about time travel it was just about sending people to the past you could scrap all of the future impact and just be like yeah they went to the past and then they came back to the present and that's it but that's what makes a time travel movie good is that you did mm -hmm. things that influence the future yeah i mean i don't disagree with that but well let's just get into it because okay. this is just all right, all right. Yeah, we're, we're all talking right, right. around it not at it right <laughs> so it starts with kind of a split between two scenes which is one is a dude running through the forest being chased by folks on horseback in medieval times mm -hmm. and the other thing is just this old dude driving through the desert listening to the eagle's greatest hits it's steve Kahn showing up for his 14th appearance in a movie directed by richard donner <laughs> yeah hit the good luck charm he was the police captain in all of those lethal weapons and god bless him he found a haircut that worked for him in the year 1974 and he kept it yeah for a second when i was watching this i was like is that richard donner <laughs> I did because because <laughs> it could have been it is his avatar in the movie you know uh -huh. so he's just rolling down the highway li listening to his yacht rock uh -huh. playlist well how, how about them opening credits it's, huh production company then you get the title of the movie timeline and then we get into all this i'm like we're three for three yeah no bullshit i know you're pleased another movie i would argue that they're just like 
just don't put my, my name on this, okay? <laughs> please. You just, please. This is, I'll take a pay cut. <laughs> look, nobody's going to remember that they saw this anyway. We got this guy, Vincent. We're going to find out. You were back and forth between this old-timey fantasy-filled world, which I got to tell you, my dislike of fantasy-based films with elves and wizards and all that kind of shit, it's pretty much adjacent to any movie where people are constantly sword fighting and wearing chainmail and jousting. This genre of film is just such a snoozer for for me huh i didn't make that connection but so it's not just fantasy films it's just any movie where telephones are not a technology well no it's not telephones i mean there are other films that i can watch where telephone isn't a technology it's just the clank clank and it's so boring this and this movie exemplifies that but i would say something like the movie excalibur for example anything but boring it's a wonderful film i even like lady hawk i think lady hawk speaking of richard donner i think lady Hawk is a great movie. I, I'm interested in in exploring where the line is. Like, at what point? What year? Are, is it 1800 when, like, okay, now we have steam engines, and so it's okay? I think it's just that the action always involves horses and just clanking of metal. And, like, that's what passes for high adventure. And I'm like, this is boring. <laughs> all right. All right. Interesting. So, so we cut back to police captain Steve Kahn from Lethal Weapons 1 through 4. And, uh, you know, he's collecting his paycheck for being in this movie. And as he's riding down the highway, suddenly our guy Vincent, who previously was running through the woods being chased by Excalibur or something. Now, Vincent is down on his knees on this dark desert highway. Cool wind in his hair. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of blood on his belly. How the heck did you get there? Welcome to this boring time travel movie. <laughs> It's amazing that Steve Kahn doesn't just bada, 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 like run over this dude, <laughs> but he doesn't. What's that? I don't care. Deer, squirrel. That's why I right. bought this big SUV. I don't have to stop for shit like that. Absolutely. Why else would you? Anyway, but he does stop for the guy and ends up being like, hey, what is this weirdo doing out in the middle of the desert? Let me throw him in the back of my car. Like you would. Like you would. Yeah. And so he also does a really good old man jog to him of just like, oh boy, I know I need to i need to get there quick but oof i don't want one of my loafers to slip off also just the knees aren't any good anymore <laughs> and i get it and so we cut to a hospital as doctors are working to save this dude's life who we also see has like slashes and bloody wounds on his body all of this is real quick exposition and the doctors show that his joints and his bones are out of alignment and like the veins and the aorta and his heart isn't lined up and his spine is all shifted out of whack he's a real mess bo it's a thing that feels like it ought to matter more because it's brought up here but it doesn't ever really matter again yeah mark that and just copy and paste in the edit of this episode <laughs> Because that's the whole damn movie. And one of the doctors says, like, it looks like he was a paper doll that got cut up and mm -hmm. taped back together. Yeah. So into the movie strolls Frank Gordon. Because they find on Vincent's neck this medallion, like on a necklace, and it's inscribed with the logo of a company called ITC. So mm -hmm. the hospital gives a ringy dingy. And then that's when Frank Gordon shows up and his clothes and haircut and creepy piercing blue eyes all say, I am the bad guy in this movie. But shocker it turns out he's not he's kind of a neutral guy but did you not think oh this is clearly a dude who's going to be up to no good yeah and one of the problems with this movie one one of the problems is that you don't really have a villain no a, a, a single villain they could be like okay that's the bad guy that's the person that our heroes are working against and who is working against our heroes gordon shows up he walks into the hospital and he's like excuse me doctors i understand you found a human jigsaw puzzle i'll take his body off your hands and hold on a moment i'm getting a call beep, 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 beep. and we cut to the two heads of the itc company a guy named doniger he has the framed cover of science American with him on it and it's on a table behind his 
desk. And I'm sure he's really proud of this achievement, but come on, man. The title of the article is The Most Powerful Man in Technology. <laughs> yeah, it's a real Mark Zuckerberg kind of cover. Yeah. There's a framed picture of Bill Clinton standing in front of the American flag. He's got pull in the government. And he's there with his business colleague, this guy named Kramer. And Doniger's on the phone with Gordon and Doniger says, was Vincent alone or was he with Decker? Oh, oh my God, really? He was? Okay, look, get all of his x-rays if it's not too much trouble and you're going to be able to get his body without anyone asking? Fantastic. Smashingly good. And if you see any painkillers lying about, stick those in your pockets. Doniger is played by David Thewlis, who's been in a bunch of movies. I like the fact that he is trying i think to do an american accent and is just nowhere near it if you don't know who he is he was the guy what turned into a werewolf in harry potter and he's the dude who got the shit kicked out of him by wonder woman in that first wonder woman movie during the finale yeah that was a pretty fair fight it's not as good as tom cruise v wilford brimley in the firm but it's close Bo. you may say that wilford brimley was old in that fight i say wilford brimley was a guy who was a bouncer for much of his life and looks like he bench presses horses on the regular. That's a fair fight. For all his running around and movie magic and stuff, Tom uh -huh. Cruise, little dainty. Little guy, little bit dainty. Wilford Brimley, no matter what age you're talking about, is going to hit you with some haymakers. Here's a fun fact that I like to carry around, being mm -hmm. the age that I am right now. Wilford Brimley, in the movie Cocoon, was 50 years old. Sure. Now look, I'm not saying he had that Benjamin Button disease that somehow just sort of stopped <laughs> at a certain point, and uh, he just remained an old man forever, but something was going on there. <laughs> he just had like that kind of stocky, I'm gonna look like i'm 50 years old from the time i'm 35 to the time i die betty white syndrome <laughs> and look like again that he could just punch you to the point that not a real man but a man like myself who's not a real man <laughs> that i would just start crying if he hit me hard enough you know he knew how to punch you in the heart one time so it'd kill you what i do is i just punch somebody in the throat god damn it. it it cuts off their oxygen they fall to their knees and then i can just make them perform moral sex on me and <laughs> really humiliate him so Doniger hangs up the phone he looks over at kramer and he says my god kramer you're the number two person here at itc if this whatever this is gets out itc will be ruined how did vincent end up in the desert and kramer says well uh, maybe he used his marker without enough clearance like it could be one of a million things which is a polite way of saying i literally have no idea how this happened there's a lot of mm, going on in this movie from every character i want to stress this right now none of this makes any sense when you watch this movie the first time it barely made sense the second time i sat through it all of the dialogue is very rapid you don't know who anybody is you don't recognize their names you don't know their relationship to one another none of it ever stitches together in a coherent way it's just a bunch of stuff that happens and it is immediately forgotten so to that end we go back to the hospital where there is a guard who apparently is, has been listening to what the doctors were saying say pally your, your buddy vincent here you know he kept saying the word castle god well between all of his screaming and yelling about his pain and how he didn't want to die what's the word castle god mean there pal gordon is like uh, uh i don't know i mean it sounds like an amusement park or something <laughs> right like hey let's go ride the twister at castle guard right twister that's a that's uh, another michael Crichton. but anyway we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later maybe it's a deodorant for your butthole like asshole guard from the makers of old spice the cop is like, man, it sure is a shame when the only person to come pick up your body is the company you work for. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's rough. <laughs> that is not the kind of life you want to be living. Cut to this large diorama of this medieval village, and it's not built to scale, though. And it's got a bunch of oversized soldiers on this battlefield in comparison to the buildings. It looks like shit. If some sophomore high school history project was like what we're seeing here, I'd give it an A because of the amount of time and let's be honest, money that went into making it. But as a college professor using it as a prop for a classroom lecture, it's D minus at best. He did it outside and you're right there. Why not just point to the place that's right over your shoulder? Because in the diary they show us that the english are dressed in red and the french are dressed in blue so we know who the players are later in the movie first of all any movie that begins with a history lesson <laughs> right 
<laughs> just knock it off. And I like history. I'm a history fan. I like studying history. But when it's just a history lecture like this, mm -hmm. it's the old familiar film trope of tell, don't show. Of like, I'm just going to tell you what to keep a lookout for. But also, you just don't know what is important, you know, at this None point in the this movie. None of is, Bo. We meet Professor Billy Connolly. Uh-huh. Who, if you don't know, Billy Connolly is a very funny Scottish comedian. Yeah. He, he, he pops up here and there. I had like a sitcom in the 80s. He's sort of beloved in Scotland in particular, but he's just a genuinely bubbly, funny, engaging guy. And as far as the actors in this movie go, even though he's largely restrained, uh -huh. he is still, it, when he is on screen, there is something interesting to look at. He is a less bitter John Cleese. You know how yeah. Cleese can come across as just being angry and arrogant? You just remove that, and that's what I think about with Billy Connolly. Billy Connolly seems like a force of pure good. Yeah, he's doing this lecture, and he's like, listen up, Klaus, this is Castle Guard and during this battle the english army the in their, in their nice red uniforms remember that that'll be important later and then they're at castle guard and then the french these wee little figures in the blue they are trying to drive the english out in this direction past the monastery and up this cliff and then paul walker rolls into our movie who, uh. who is clearly like 30 to 35 and he is dressed like an undercover cop trying to pass <laughs> for 17 to bus kids for selling dope and at first i honestly thought that paul walker was this incredibly handsome man who had special needs which he may be in this movie i'm still not sure it's a real like hello fellow children like that kind of vibe to his <laughs> character in this movie and it turns out that he is the son of professor billy Connolly, and uh -huh. he's dressed in this 1990s era softcore grunge musician clothing there's a lot of flannel underneath t-shirts i feel pretty confident if you tug down the collar of his shirt there'd be a puka necklace hiding in there oh a hundred percent yes <laughs> Billy Connolly says the English took up in Castle Rook it was well fortified and is very strong then the camera cuts over to a bunch of what you are going to have to assume are students because they don't ever explain any of this and we hear the Scottish accent of Billy Connolly continue but you're like wait a minute that's like the same accent only 30 years younger and we cut over and it's Gerard Butler who's uh -huh. now taking over lecture duties and i was like wait how can there be two scottish accents in the same early 2000s movie and neither of them is being done by mike myers hey it's a stutter <laughs> <laughs> legitimate scottish accents happening and he's like what billy Connolly said was right but let me add one other wrinkle to this there's a woman her name is lady claire she was hung from the battlements and inspired the french to rally turning the tide of the battle let me tell you this lady claire she was a sweet piece of cake never before <laughs> Or has a more beautiful name been uttered from human lips? She was incredibly sexy from everything that I could find out. Oh, what I wouldn't give to have a nibble of the sweet Lady Claire. Are you taking notes, classroom? It's going to be on the final exam. And for you in the audience, pay attention. This is all coming up later. As we're excavating, I'm hoping to find at least part of her skeleton. And then I'm going to dress it up <laughs> in, a, in a wee dress. Carry her around like me wife. <laughs> We go to the tent where Billy Connolly is ironing a shirt. Uh-huh. And Paul Walker, his, in quotes, son, comes in. <laughs> Hi, and it's, Pop! Yeah, it, it is very much the Lon Chaney Jr. to Claude Rains from the original Wolfman of, you know, welcome back to the castle, son. Hiya, Pop! <laughs> you have been away for a long time. But where are we in this movie? Are we in England? Are we in France? Are we in Scotland? Is this a Shrek convention? I, I have no idea anything about this movie! I think we're supposed to be in France because they're excavating... This area that, you know, we'll get to later, but Billy Connolly hands Paul Walker the iron. And I like this one where he's like, take a wee spin around that shit if you would. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, okay. It really Tom Sawyer's Paul Walker into doing his ironing, which I yeah. enjoy. I was thinking about modifying my wheel. What say you iron my shirt while well, I contemplate what I'm going to do with my vast fortune? Paul Walker's like, oh, uh, okay, Dad. Hey, I also got some clippers for you to trim your build. What's going on, Dad? Well, the information we've been getting from Doniger and the other people at ITC, it's just too good. So... 
I'm going to take a wee spin down to the head office, see what's going on. And let me also say, when you watch this movie the first time, you don't know that Doniger's name is Doniger. They have not really established that. So when they're talking about Doniger, it's like, is that a place? Is it a person? We are being much more deliberate in calling out the name of the company and the name of the characters. It's all glossed over. None of this clicks together. It, it is very difficult to figure out who is who and what their job is or like what their role in the film is have a scene where billy Connolly is on the phone with doniger so you're like oh they know each other oh they're funding their research oh the information that doniger is giving him is way too accurate because here you're just like like what's a doniger like i don't know paul walker though is just like oh, yeah whatever dad listen w what do you think about kate and like me and kate hooking up and billy Connolly uh, very quickly is like oh no lad she's like me she's an archaeologist the way he puts it is if you make it the choice between you and rocks you're gonna lose. Uh, also, you're dumb as the rocks that she's uncovering. She's got a master's degree in advanced archaeological studies. Paul Walker, you once completed the maze on the back of Honey Nut Cheerios, and I saw you. You started from the finish line, which is technically cheating. You're not meant to be together, son. You're a dimwit. Immediately, we cut to Kate. Mm -hmm. the subject of this conversation who is in fact digging up some tunnel which we will later learn is a completely lost cause yeah, yeah. but paul walker shows up with a beer no he's got two beers well a beer for for her as well i thought they were both for him <laughs> <laughs> and just starts awkwardly coming on to her like yeah, you sure like to brush those rocks a lot huh <laughs> and she's like look you're the boss's son and i appreciate the beer at all but this is not a good idea oh i'm just hoping that you'd notice that i was coming on to you and she's like eh, let me stop you right there mm -hmm. and then she this is an almost direct quote from the movie and it's one of the coldest things that you can say to someone it's like oh i was kind of hoping that you would notice that i hadn't noticed and that you would stop uh -huh. because you knew i knew what was going on and i just didn't care <laughs> then she just takes off like she grabs the beer she's like thanks for the beer bye mm -hmm. and so she's gone leaving paul to be like oh i think there's a chance we cut to paul walker riding his motorcycle maybe it's a few days later maybe it's the next day maybe it's next week we have no idea paul walker rides his motorcycle over to the ruins of Arok, which is this castle and he comes over to gerard butler who is practicing archery though i sure hope uh -huh. that comes into play later in our movie he's got a bow and arrow plus ancient swords and bloodletting equipment a bucket of leeches he's got a drill to open holes in the skulls of others to let out evil spirits he's really into this medieval nonsense to the point that he says stuff like it was a time when people really cared about one another gerard butler asked paul walker he's like so how did it go with kate last night did you put that pill in your drink like you said you would he's like no i didn't kate lives in the past like you the past is where my parents split up the past sucks archaeology sucks everything sucks and gerard butler gives the most convoluted explanation of how looking to the past is actually looking to the future and Gerard Butler says, and I quote, What's the future? But more of the same. More machines. More gadgets. The past is where it's at. People cared about each other. Meathead honor. Did I ever tell you about this rockin' hottie lady Claire who got hung by the English? She was a smoking perfect teen. What I wouldn't give to have a chance to see her walking around wiggling left and right. Lady Claire. That's where it was at. Come take a, a wee look at this. Look at this sock. <laughs> Look at this lady and this guy with no ear. I wonder what happened there. Probably won't come into the movie at all. <laughs> he says, it's strange because they're holding hands. Look at that. And it's kind of close to his dick. You know, <laughs> they must have been in love. I think he's got a little bit of a boon there. That's not an accident. You had to work extra hard to care of that. Paul Walker's like, what ear? Is that Picasso? Oh, it's doubtful, laddie. You know? I notice you're looking at me. You want to know their story. I'll tell you what their story is. She went down on him like a champ she did and and considering their lack of dental hygiene she probably didn't have any teeth you ever had a bit of a bj from a woman who's toothless you haven't lived till you had a gum job lady you have to pay a bit extra in town but it's worth every penny <laughs> 
<laughs> and then he starts to repeat his mantra apparently and paul walker kind of cuts him off is like yeah yeah i get it people make their own history he's yeah. like oh you've heard me say that before have you i say it a lot you make your own history trademark registered gerard butler you know in a few years i'm gonna be saving the white house but first i'm gonna get me hands on this french tot so we cut to later that day or maybe it's next week who knows and someone blasts an air horn at first i thought hey the three-legged race just kicked off but then someone shouts out hey there's a cave-in at the old monastery so all of these students go running gerard butler and kate they strap on some gear and they get lowered down into a hole in the ground doesn't look much like a cave-in to me bo unless yeah, yeah, the cave-in yeah. was just a hole that opened up allowing them to go down into this undiscovered location and while they're romping around in there gerard butler finds a document box amidst these ruins and then kate finds a wall carving that's been smashed to bits and kate says what kind of a son of a bitch would deliberately destroy something so beautiful you're like mm, i bet we're gonna find that out later uh it, there's a lot of this setup and payoff of not since the invention of the telegraph <laughs> has something been so telegraphed like between gerard butler like i wonder what the story is of this weird statue's ear and kate being like hey i wonder what happened with the why would somebody destroy or something this beautiful it's like even people who have never seen a movie before understand that it's you that did this the place starts to cave back in but before they go gerard butler stops and is like look at that it looks like a wee bit of glass and he grabs it and they head up and so we immediately get the story of this glass thanks to josh the resident physicist on this archaeological dig sure question well, mark yeah well i mean if you're gonna go out and do an archaeological dig you'd need to have a physicist there bo i really don't understand his wow. presence and later on i understand it even less they have a physicist they have a meteorologist there's a guy who can perform phrenology uh -huh. um, <laughs> there's, there's a, right. a pedicurist an experimental astronomer <laughs> so that they understand where stars were in position of the sky here's the thing about all the stuff that they're telegraphing in in the original back to the future like at the beginning when marty goes to the mall and it's twin pine mall and then when he comes back and it's now lone pine mall because he ran over one of the tree right right it, nice little moment in the movie this movie would be like if marty mcfly just shows up at the mall the first time and it's just lone pine mall like everything that they do in the past has already occurred in the future and there's no consequence there's no impact to the things they do in the past that change the future whatsoever it doesn't matter and again the theory is that it has to have happened otherwise they never would have gone back in the first place i guess i get that if you put a time travel movie really under the microscope and you start to examine it the threads fall apart pretty quickly but in this case you're just starting with a big pile of threads it's just not a good time travel and the movie tries to say that it's not a time travel movie, but who are we kidding? Right. Josh, the physicist, is like, you guys, this bifocal lens is impossible because according to all my carbon dating it's 600 years old and also there is this note from the professor on this document that is the same age that basically says help me sign the professor also the physicist also a handwriting expert sure because he says yeah i compared it to his signature and it's definitely the same mm -hmm. and paul walker is like wait I know what's going on here. Everybody stand down. I got this figured out. He's playing a prank. He always did. Like when I was a kid and he said he was going to go get cigarettes and he never came back. <laughs> until i tracked him down that time that i accidentally ran into him at a bus stop he's a prankster and they're like that's impossible yeah because nobody had been in that chamber for 600 years so there was no way for him to get in there and leave said prank devices yeah oh uh, i don't know i mean he's pretty smart they're like all right you're gonna need to sit down while the rest of us sort this out hold on a minute my dad said he's going to itc i'm gonna call that company up real quick boop, 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 boop. hello it's me paul walker i'm looking for my dad you tell me where he is or i'm calling the fbi reporting missing kidnapping person of interest apb 104 what okay they said they're gonna send a plane to pick us all up <laughs> i love the fact too that while they're going over this paul walker puts his hand on kate's shoulder and she gives him or the hand a look like what in the hell he's such a creep he looks like the living composite sketch of every campus date rapist ever <laughs> <laughs> it's shocking that a that he is this old and apparently has no job 
Also, that he continues to creep on Kate in a way that she is clearly not into. No. But sure enough, they're going to ITC headquarters. But we need to lay out who's going. So it, it's Kate. Uh -huh. It's Gerard Butler. That's it's right. It's Paul Walker, the idiot. It's Josh, the physicist. And a guy named Francois, who we haven't even met in this movie yet. He's come along too. Because of being French. Well, they all go uh, to ITC headquarters and Kramer, Doniger's partner, he comes out and he explains to this group of archaeologists somewhat he says uh look uh, technology's made great advances since the fax machine and doniger the smartest man in technology according to scientific american he saw the movie charlie and the chocolate factory starring gene wilder and thought the idea of wonka vision should be turned into a real idea so he created a machine that would send objects from one place to another but unfortunately this experiment turned out like that kid's invention in the fantastic four <laughs> reboot that really sucked they're basically trying to invent the wonka vision thing and accidentally made a machine that sent an apple back in time and kramer is like and because he is the smartest man on earth he had the brilliant idea to send a camera and point it up at the sky and we learned that it was going to a place in france called castle guard in the year 1357 this is where they're like so this is not exactly time travel this is just a wormhole that is at this particular place in time and so don't worry about the time travel stuff let me get this straight you time fax my dad's glasses and they wrote a letter in the year 13 and he's like, uh, no, your father is in the year 1357, and we need all of you to go back and get him. And Josh the physicist immediately calls bullshit on the plot of this movie using just basic science and narrative structure as the linchpins to his argument. And Paul Walker just jumps, he's like, I don't care about science, math, and how machines make cotton candy. I want my dad back because my mom won't talk to me after I sold a bunch of her stuff. Doniger shows up. Hello, everyone. Well, it turns out that your father, I mean, your father, was getting suspicious because of all of the good clues that we gave him about where to dig. So we sent him back in time to do something. I realize there's no logic behind why we would do this. It really leads to the incoherent nature of this movie's plot. So guess what? How would all of you want to go back in time to save the professor? It's a lot like Back to the Future 3, only not fun, not exciting, and certainly not not entertaining when they ask him rightly why did you send him back oh uh, what's all over there well your father can be very persuasive so he just talked you into being sent back in time sure what that thing you just said that sounds good uh, all right everybody says yeah we'll go back in time except for josh the physicist who's like hell no you're not gonna like take my molecules apart and reconfigure them back together i saw cronenberg's the fly fuck that and frank gordon shows back up to be like we need to get all of you prepped and ready to go back into time in this mm -hmm. medieval france situation doniger tells him the professor's been gone for 72 hours every minute in the past there's a greater likelihood we'll never be able to get him back why is that i don't know i just made it up what i also like that the you know after everybody's like all right fine we're going except for josh who rightfully is like you can no! all go to hell <laughs> right go back to a place where you could <laughs> die of a toenail infection no gordon does say i'm not going to be going back with you but i'm going to send my two best men dead me one and dead meat two and then doniger's like mm, gordon i really think you should go dead meat one and two they're very capable albeit expendable employees but i think you should go plus if you see decker you know what to do wait who or what is a decker like, I just <laughs> right. figured out what a Doniger was. Now you're talking about Deckers? One of the big problems with this movie is it's got <laughs> One. <laughs> way too many characters. We're doing and our best to keep it straight for you. If you see Decker, you know what to do. And you're like, who? What is he? What should he do? But I do like the fact that Gordon is just like, you know, I'm going to sit this one out. And Doniger's <laughs> like, I really think you should go. I'm good. No, no, you're going to go. And so, yeah, he ends up going to the locker room with all of the other knuckleheads who are going yeah. back in time. And it's like, all right, close over there. Get yourself some medieval duds. They're pre-populated with urine and feces stains. We also <laughs> sprinkled some lice on them for authenticity. A little bit of smallpox on there, too. Just get you used to it. While they're getting dressed up, Kramer is alone with Doniger. And Kramer says, mm, don't you think you should have told those people how if they go on this trip, their bones and veins 
chains and other body stuff will get all wonky, you know, like that guy we saw at the beginning of the movie. And Doniger's like, no, that was his tenth trip. This is their first. They might come back with a lazy eye or a stutter. <laughs> Nothing to be alarmist about. Perhaps they won't be able to recognize the color purple. Who's to say? Who needs purple? Be honest with me. It's one of the least interesting colors. I think we can all agree on that, but <laughs> they're going to be fine. Honestly, it's Gordon that I'm worried about. He's gone back a bunch of times. He could come back missing an arm. <laughs> so they all go down and they get into this time travel machine, which is a big platform surrounded by mirrors. Truly, it looks like a high-tech version of something you'd see at a county fair. And Josh is like still refusing to go. So we have Gerard Butler, Kate, Paul Walker, and Francois because he speaks French. What does Paul Walker add to this mix? Just expendability? He actually says when they're breaking down, like, well, it's important for Francois to go because he speaks French and Gerard Butler knows the area. Kate knows the layout of the place. And Paul Walker is just like, oh, I'm definitely going because it's my dad. <laughs> so? Yeah. Well, I, you know, we're connected that way like there was that time when he was supposed to take me to the circus but he didn't take me to the circus but like when he said he was going to take me to the circus i knew he really wasn't going to take me so that's <laughs> the kind of connection we have so everybody gets this necklace with a little button on it that can be used to return them to the present and one of these markers it turns out later can bring everybody back so it's not a one-to-one -one relationship and you're like where did this technology come from what is yeah. this based on it's just incoherent coherent it's stupid also it took me to the second time watching this to get the oh not everyone needs one thing because i was trying to do the math on if he lost his here and then how is he going to get this other one back and then at a certain point it's like oh right none of this matters okay no. got it so we have Gerard Butler, Kate, Francois, who are vital to our mission. Paul Walker is there, and he never wears shoes because laces frighten and anger him. And uh -huh. then we have Gordon. We have Dead Meat 1, Dead Meat 2. They're all going back to save the professor. They have six hours to do it. Why six hours? Why not, Bo? We got to put a timer on this somehow. And For the... no reason! Right. It's because that's as long as we can keep the wormhole open? None of it matters. Doniger walks over to Francois, and he says, Sorry, Frenchie, no glasses. That's where we goofed up with the professor. You goofed up with the professor. You said you haven't talked to him in three days. What does that mean? And they, they, and they take his glasses and that doesn't matter. He's like, oh, I cannot see without my glasses. You're like, oh, that's going to make a difference. Nope. Because this character doesn't stick around long enough for it to make a difference. Yeah. All right. So everybody climbs onto this platform with the mirrors all around it. And then they're all dressed like they're going to a Renaissance fair or a Stevie Nicks concert. And then somebody hits a button, zip, zap, zoop. Everyone goes back to 1357 where they are arrive in a rapidly moving river where one by one everybody immediately gets saved uh-huh well this is thrilling nope and then at home base at itc josh doniger and kramer they're just hanging out waiting around and kramer explains basically you have to put your thumbnail into this marker device and it shows you how much time you have left paul walker looks at the group and he's like hey this place looks like my grandparents house in oregon pop pop it's me paul walker <laughs> But I'm dressed like a Gargamel. I'm dressed like a Gargamel. And then Gordon comes over and he's like, shut up, dummy. Look, here's what you do. This shows you your time remaining to get home. If you squeeze it real hard, it'll send you back to the present. But don't squeeze it because we haven't found the professor yet. You mean my professor, dad? Yeah, that's the one. This French peasant boy runs by shouting and Francois translates, is that the boy? He says, we should be hiding now. So everybody hides and a bunch of English soldiers show up dressed in red, just like in the diorama at the beginning of the movie and the head knight who i'm just gonna go ahead and point out now this is decker the guy that doniger mentioned earlier to gordon and he's like you know what to do again none of this matters but it makes it easier to keep track of the characters as we continue through the story yeah so decker pulls out a sword and kills dead meat one r.i.p dead meat one and so he's immediately killed then another dude dead meat two uh -huh. just gets lit up by dudes firing arrows into him yeah he pulls out a hand grenade and pulls the pin but he also zaps himself back to the present and yeah. so dead meat 2 returns immediately back to the mirrored time travel portal and then he drops the grenade which blows up the platform and the whole room so you're right. like oh shit they're not going to be able to come back to the present because he just blew everything up that's right but that's not the case Bo. so then gerard butler distracts all the soldiers who are coming to murder all of the 
people hiding in the woods or whatever. Yeah, all of his friends. Hey, over here! And gets them to chase after him, leads them away from the others. His friends go and hide in a safe location about 30 feet over there. And Frank Gordon shows up out of nowhere and is like, hey, what'd I miss? <laughs> and they're like, you're not going to believe this, but those two guys that were hanging out with us, you mean the Marines? Yeah, those guys, one of them got killed with a sword over there and the other one pulled out a tin cup and pulled a pen out of it and then disappeared. I think he was a ghost with a can of soup. <laughs> Wait, are you saying that he had a grenade and then went back to the future? If you say so, that sounds good. I mean, I'm not saying that he didn't. <laughs> Gerard Butler then runs off, hides in this a hobbit hole, essentially, yeah. where the lady, it turns out, wasn't a boy at all. It was a lady that was running through the woods. Oh, saying, is that who it was? Yeah. I didn't catch that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It was Lady Claire from the beginning. Well, did that you ruined it. That's the big surprise, Bo. Oh, that was a big surprise. <laughs> Francois is freaked out during all this. When we come back to the main group, I'm mashing my button and getting the fuck out of here and then gordon jumps in he's like hey i forgot to mention another pointless detail you need 40 feet of clearance on all side to make the time travel medallion work like why is that uh just because and so we get a cut to the present where doniger is just like oh boy this is not good and josh who again all he has done so far is not go back to the past uh -huh. is like Tell me you've got a backup plan. And Doniger's like, uh, we have a backup plan? <clears throat> and Josh's like, that's what I want to hear. Back in the Hobbit hole, Gerard Butler, he's in there with the, we're going to later find out, is Lady Claire. And they're hiding in there. And one of the Englishmen comes by and he gets killed. So Gerard Butler grabs this dead guy's sword. And because he's really into LARPing and pretending he's a Jedi and other fantasy-related adult fun, he mm -hmm. has this weapon. Now, about this time, a bunch of, I think, Frenchmen show up. And we get a real thrilling battle of these people on their horses, like clink clanging with one another. It's Team Red versus Team Blue. So you know who to root for sort of and it's a lot like that diorama and then mm -hmm. the french woman in the hole she climbs out and she immediately gets captured by this english knight and then gerard butler he pops out of the hobbit hole he stabs this knight who falls to the ground they wrestle for a bit and then gerard butler bow he just like puts his hand over this guy's nose and mouth and just like suffocates the life out of him it's a real like saving private ryan moment of i'm just gonna murder this dude he just watches the life disappear from his eyes that's crazy. Yeah. Gerard Butler is a maniac in this movie. <laughs> it's the first time I've really felt alive, taking the life of another. I've got one of those famous murder boners I've had at so much about. <laughs> Look at it. Watch this. Clank, clank, clank. That's me hitting it on the sword. It's... <laughs> <laughs> When they say it can get as hard as, as steel, they're not lying. Anyway, so we go back to the future where Doniger is working on his computer, doing a little clickety-clack on his keyboard. Uh-huh. And Josh just pops into the frame. Well, how much time is this going to take? And Doniger is like, it will take five hours and 27 minutes. Because that's all the time we have. Josh does the same thing where he just pops in a frame. It's like an old 90s commercial for a kid's toy or something, huh? where a guy just pops up from the bottom of the screen to be like, what? And he asks Kramer, and what are you working on? Uh, the markers seem to be the only thing holding the wormhole open, so we're gonna have to do our best, I guess. And Josh is just an unhelpful reporter in this scene. He's not actually doing anything to help. He's just asking the actual people working on stuff what they're doing to fix the situation. Which is kind of a staple for a lot of Michael Crichton books and movies of having the person who doesn't know what's going on talking to people that do know what's going on so we, the audience, can find out what's going on. So I don't fault that, but it's just that none of this is... There's no logic to any of this whatsoever. It's all just made-up bullshit. We come back to the 1300s, and Gerard Butler and this mystery woman, they run through the woods, and luckily they find their friends immediately, as you do when you're wandering through the woods. And everybody heads over to this French village, and Gerard Butler butler immediately recognized he's like ah oh, we're at castle guard village what day is it the 4th of april 1357 that's the day the french attack remember we talked about it with that shitty diorama at the start of the movie and by the end of the day this place will be burned to the ground okay i got it they're starting to debate kate especially is like oh i never would have put that thing on the right over there i thought it was on the left and blah 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 and then as if 
if the movie needs to show up to remind them that this is all more serious than their excavation, uh -huh. a bunch of English soldiers show up and just starts chasing him around. Yeah. And they're immediately captured. Well, they get taken to this English stronghold where we meet our movies. I'm going to say bad guy. His mm. name's Lord Oliver. And in there, he's practicing sword fighting with these oversized candy canes. And Gerard Butler tells Lord Oliver, I am from Scotland. I'm not English. And Lord Oliver says, oh, yes, we have an old man from Scotland who showed up a few days ago as well. How delightful. And you there, the tall one who said nothing with squinty eyes. What's your name? And Francois says, oh, uh -huh. I am Francois, proud Frenchman, as well as a ladies man. And then Lord Oliver's like, oh, I'm going to kill you. And he stabs him in the belly and then francois he's gone r.i.p francois and so the rest of them are just thrown into a cell well it's an uh, attic that's where they stick them take them upstairs where we put all those children from <laughs> flowers in the attic Paul Walker shouts out, oh, guys, I lost my marker. I think it might be at my house next to my GameCube. Paul, just go sit over there. And then Kate wanders around the attic and she pulls back a curtain and she finds the professor and he's like, oh, Kate, it's you. Please don't tell me you brought my dolt of a son. Oh, oh, son, my son, I'm so happy to see you here. Paul Walker's like, I got some bad news, dad. Francois is dead and I lost my marker and I'm really hungry. The one that you had next to the GameCube. Yeah, yeah. That, that one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <sighs> That was your favorite. Am I still in the will? Oh, son, you were never in the will. That's good news. You don't want to be in the will because that way you don't get anything. And Billy Connolly, they ask him like, hey, how did you survive even this long? Oh, I told him I was a magister. That's a scientist. I mean, Frank Gordon immediately is like, <laughs> oh, what? I lied to him. I told him I was a wizard and I told him I could make Greek fire. That's a fire so intense that water won't quench it. They're like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. If you could tilt the, the balance of history. Yeah, I know. It's a real thrill to have this much power that you could change everything for globally. <laughs> Just by giving people small advances in technology. I'm pretty sure I can be a god. <laughs> Gordon chimes in. Look, we found the professor. Let's get out of here. Run over to that peasant field. Find 40 feet of clearance. And then we're just going to set off our marker and head back to present day. All right? Kate finds out she's the only one that can squeeze through this hole that they make in the wall. We've only got four hours to pull this plan off. <laughs> so we're down to four hours now, Bo. So she's going to go basically scale down the wall, which she does. Mm -hmm. And then... Because because why should Gerard Butler get all the fun? She takes this arrow that she swipes from outside a window. Yep. And a guard comes over and she just stabs him under his rib cage and into his heart. Yep. Murdering him. Then lets down the stairs so that everybody can come out of the attic just in time for them to all curb stop a another guard that comes in. This is two archaeologists that are now murderers. Yeah. Yeah. They have just murdered at least three people so far. And Gerard Butler really has a taste for it because they're like, hey, we need to get out of here. And Gerard Butler is like, you all go ahead. I'm going to see if I can find that wee French lassie. She won't be harder to find. I, my nose got a, a real whiff of her stench. I think she's this way. <laughs> so he runs off with a bow and arrow that he finds. And they're like, oh, thank God we saw him being quite the archer earlier in the movie. This guy at the end of a guard at the end of a hallway starts to stand up when he sees Gerard Butler and Butler is like stand down laddie and the guy doesn't so he just lets fly and kills that guy yeah and there's a moment where he's like why'd you do it I told you to stand down <laughs> but sure enough, the guy is murdered nonetheless. Yeah. And then Decker shows up, who we don't know it's Decker. And oh, again, one of those like, oh, on the second watch, I realized, oh, right. This is the villain question mark of the movie. I, I think he's like the number two to Lord Oliver. And just to go ahead and explain this, Decker used to work for ITC. He traveled back and forth and just decided to stay in the 1300s and become a knight in the English army. The whole point was, when Doniger tells Frank Gordon, hey, if you've seen Decker, you know what to do. Yeah, kick him in the nuts and give him a wedge. It's time to get his <laughs> right. ass back here. But that begs the question of like, what was he supposed to do? Because when Gordon finally runs afoul of Decker, uh -huh. they talk about the dinner that they had. Yeah, but we'll does, get to that. 
because none of it matters. So right. Decker comes in and he's going to kill Gerard Butler. So Gerard Butler, he opens this door that leads to a room where our mystery woman, Lady Claire, is being held and he locks the door. Then Decker runs down with an axe and just goes full Jack Torrance. He's beating down the door. Then Lady Claire and Gerard Butler, they just start smashing this adobe wall that just, mm-hmm. it, it's like, it's just mud. It falls apart and there's a hole. So they escape, the two of them. And then miraculously, this French woman now starts speaking fluent English and Gerard Butler says, sexy lassie, let's head down to the river. One of us could use a dip in cleansing waters to wash off whatever that smell is on you. And so they <laughs> head to the river. And then the rest yeah. of the gang, they're protesting with Gordon. We can't leave without Gerard Butler. And Gordon says, look, my job was to find the professor and bring him back. We got the professor. Let's get the hell out of here. And then he sees a medallion. There's two hours and 30 minutes left until they're stuck there forever. And the gang, they get separated and then they all kind of get back together. They have two and a half hours left but they can't get back and w- there's the cut to the present where kramer is like oh hey we got this faint signal from one of the markers which means that they're alive because that was a question after grenade guy came back right is maybe they're all dead now they know they're alive and then that's where frank just runs to a clearing is like screw all the rest of you i'm going home oh yeah. wait i can't because his thing don't work so they all just slink off to hide yeah. Gerard Butler is in the river pushing this upside down giant turtle shell of a boat and the mystery French woman, Lady Claire, she's in it. And Gerard Butler says, by the way, I'm Gerard Butler with Castle Guardia Village. Don't worry, you'll return there soon. And the mystery French woman says, no, the English will burn it to the ground before they move on to La Roque. And Gerard Butler says, no, no, did you see the speech I gave at the start of the movie? The French are going to be inspired by the death of this super sexy lady. Clara and she gets hung and then they'll defeat the English and Laroque it's going to fall tonight and she says you are either a fool or a prophet by looking at you I think that you are the fool let me ask you something Lady Claire are you seeing anyone are you married you got anybody serious in your life you're a stranger I don't even know who you are but I'm single uh, I never had sex with someone from the 1500s I once did it with a, a blind girl that's about as close as a goat yes I see you right now what do you mean no are you seeing anybody you seeing him like romantically I I don't know what you are what do you mean and he says you know it's funny we're speaking the same language but you don't understand the word i say you ignorant simpleton you barely have the education of a preschooler i've got multiple phds back in my time i was just some weirdo who loved to swing a sword around but here I'm the smartest person anyone knows. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what numbers are? Let's start with the basics. When I ask you this question, how many fingers am I holding up? You keep saying yes. I think we're off to a bad start. Maybe a good start. (laughs) I'd say that I like them dumb, but that just seems unfair. (laughs) I'm literally the smartest man on planet Earth right now. (laughs) Wait, is the professor here? I haven't seen him yet, but if he's here, then he's probably the smartest man, but I'm easily number two. Yeah, but he can't even put phone numbers into his phone and save them. I have to help him do that. I've at least got that on him. Oh, and he can't set his wee VCR clock. I have to do that for him all the time. I am the smartest man alive. And he refuses to get the DVD player because he's got so many VHS tapes. Most of him are porno. He says they're irreplaceable. So they make their way to shore. And a bunch of French soldiers are there to help her onto shore. And th- Lady Claire, we can help you. And Gerard Butler's like, wait a minute. You're the sexy Lady Claire? Who would have seen this coming? Surprise, surprise. This woman that he has been with the entire time, it, it turns out, is Lady Claire. Some English across the way, some English archers show up and are firing arrows across the river at him. Poorly firing arrows. It looks like they gave bows and arrows to the crew and just told them to shoot them. And it's a lot of like doing like they don't even go straight they just up in the air and then down into the water they are firing with the ac- accuracy of your general stormtrooper <laughs> one of the guys gets hit gerard butler ends up saving him and get you know kind of dragging him to safety and then we cut away from that for a minute because frank gordon and his team are just waiting it out in some empty house somewhere yeah they're like in the peasants quarters it's gordon and kate paul walker and the professor and kate is just dealing with the guilt of murdering a man and paul walker comes over in hopes to leverage this in a way to emotionally exploit her to get in her panties it's okay baby have you considered some 
fucking post murder boner sex. <laughs> it's weird because I didn't kill anybody, but I'm the one with the murder boner. And only a murderer can make a murder boner go away is what I just said. It's like when you have to burn part of the person who's cursed hair to get rid of a <laughs> witch's spell. You know how that works, right? About this time, an English soldier uses a horse's ass to knock down the door of the peasant's hovel. Yeah. It's a real early version of the battering ram. They just storm in. They're coming from everywhere. Everybody gets dragged out except for Kate and Paul Walker. Yeah, they escape. After the house is set fire to, and Billy Connolly is like, Oh no, you've killed my son. No! I can't believe I'll never see him again. And everyone here sees that I'm so distraught and upset. So if anyone asks questions later, I have witnesses to how upset I'm. Oh! Oh, oh, Kate was in there too. Oh, that is a yeah, shame. She was quite good. Kate. That's really what he is upset by. <laughs> yeah, they just kind of flee into the woods, Kate and, and Paul Walker do. But then they immediately come back. A hundred percent. Because a lot of this is just, we were captured, then we're going to escape just to be recaptured again. Yeah. The French are assessing all their horses after a little bit of a battle, and Lady Claire's there. And then we meet her handsome brother and fellow freedom fighter lord arnault everyone here speaks french with subtitles while gerard butler stands around hoping that they're not talking shit about him and the movie switches to english because gerard butler and the audience don't speak french and didn't nobody go to the <laughs> movies to read and gerard butler says i keep an eye on your sister i must return to castle guard to search for my friends by the way can i have a horse and maybe a cool sword so i can fight uh the English or anybody else that gives me a hard time. And they're like, yeah, 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 sure. Just take a horse and uh, just pick out a few swords if you want, some chain mail, whatever you want. There's some uh, muffins. If you're hungry, take a couple of those with you. Subscribe. You want somebody to just kind of jot down your thoughts, you know, your adventures? Want to have a record of that? We, we got a couple of scribes. We'll send two with you. One English, one French. I know we don't speak French, but it would be good to have it. Here is the point in the movie where I thought, you know, this is actually not necessarily a great movie. Oh, it is not. It would be way better if the whole movie were just Gerard Butler is going back in time to save this professor, and you're just following him. That it's this guy who's kind Kind of enamored with the time period and is somewhat if not trained at least is prepared to deal with it to some extent right and then finds himself falling in love with this historical figure and debating whether or not he wants to save her life because if he does so it could change the future just get rid of all the paul walker and kate and like all these other characters just simplify it so that you get rid of all that nonsense it's just gerard butler that you're following and his journey through this to save this professor or you send back gerard butler you send back the marine and then you combine paul walker's character and kate's character it's kate but kate's the daughter of the professor and she's an archaeologist okay yeah, okay and so right. she's following in her dad's foot steps but they still have a little friction because of father daughter and being competing in the same field of study and then mm -hmm. also all the shit at the beginning the guy with the one ear and the busted wall you don't do that there you show the sarcophagus of just lady claire by herself then at the end when they come back it's lady claire and gerard butler together then it's like oh this thing in the past and he lived his life and here's what happened in the future like oh yeah. then this all makes sense but they didn't do any of that there is a way to make this if not a good movie at the very least a cleaner kind yeah. of story don't just randomly kill characters and they're gonna kill more people that we've talked about we won't ruin that for you yet but it's wild how characters just disappear from this movie out of the blue which i think would possibly work better as a novel where yeah. you had more time with these characters and reading something that took you six eight ten twelve hours to get through however big this book is therefore it would be less shocking that you just met someone that you're immediately going to kill. So anyway, Gerard Butler, he walks over to Lady Claire and he says, I wish we'd met at another time. You're such a red hot alabaster skin sex rocket. And then Lady Claire looks at him and she says, Gerard Butler, let me ask you a question. Are you married? And he says, oh, no, but I know who I would marry <laughs> if I were ever to get married. Wink, wink. Did you see me wink? Am I as Lady Claire? 
Where I come from, I'm considered a bit of a weirdo. <laughs> I'm off-putting. People find the fact that I go out and LARP on the weekends by myself to be a bit strange. But here, it's just normal behavior. Even in the rapping community, I'm a bit of a pariah because I don't want to use their foam swords. I want to use the real thing. Maybe lop off a leg or two. I have a bit of a bloodlust. Lady Claire, before I say my goodbyes, will you let me take two of my fingers, swipe them in your armpit so I can carry a bit of a stench with me as I go off on my future adventures? That's another thing that I'm <laughs> scorned for in the future. Asking for people's sweat. Usually it's prostitutes. If I pay them enough money, though, they usually I, agree. I can't get them to come back a second time. <laughs> That's why I'm going through <laughs> prostitutes at an incredible rate. She leans in and gives him a kiss. And I was like, her breath had to just smell like the dumpster behind some Gulf Coast seafood shack in August. I mean, it had to just be rancid, right? Oh, yes. So I mean, all of these people stink. <laughs> disease the fact that most of them are in their 30s and 40s means that they are in late late old age <laughs> this english spy returns to the other soldiers and he has seen that arnott is back and he's with his sister the mysterious lady claire and they all decide to go kill him we cut to paul walker and kate who again they just escaped the village so they've returned and paul walker says i gotta go save professor dad kate could you teach me some parkour real quick and I'll zip up and get him out of the window where I think he is. And Kate's like, look, Paul Walker, you can't do that. You're going to get killed there's gotta be a way to save professor dad and kate says oh there's a way but if you try it you're gonna get killed because you're an idiot do you remember that time you found that bag of yarn and we ended up in the emergency room paul walker oh yeah that was real bad well this is more complicated than that but i've got an idea we could go back to that tunnel that i was sifting through at the start of the movie that's in the monastery and i think that'll help us get into fort la Roque, which is what they're gonna do this tunnel that she was excavating in the future or yeah. wherever we see a line of people fleeing from this village of castle guard as night is approaching and the fires are burning the place to the ground and we have like two hours to wrap this up in real time for our yeah, yeah. all right frank gordon and billy Connolly, aka professor ted are tied up and being kind of dragged along by this wagon they're walking behind it with their wrist bound a bunch of English soldiers show up to attack the French army who were kind of hiding in the woods. And then a bunch of soldiers chase down Gerard Butler and Decker is one of these English soldiers. He grabs the marker around Gerard Butler's neck and kind of yanks it off of him. And then they hit Gerard Butler in the back of the head with the hilt of a sword to knock him out. And then he's just immediately thrown on top of the wagon that Frank Gordon and Billy Connolly are tied to. That's convenient. I mean, this is a pretty big caravan. So yeah. I'm glad they tossed him with the two other people that he knows from the future. Billy Connolly is like, Oh, Gerard Butler, you're alive. Oh, I have bad news. Kate and well, less so Paul are dead. <laughs> and then Decker rides up. Hey, motherfucker. You remember me? I'm Decker from the future. Yeah. Look at my face. Is this familiar to you? Should be. Because you left me here, you piece of shit. Frank is like, hey, hey, look, you need to come back with us. I, we, we didn't leave you on uh -huh. purpose. We just had to get out of here. Uh -huh. Yeah. I can't ever go back because of them transcription errors. Yeah. Like, I've been back and forth like 10 times. I go back. I'm going to end up with my ding dong in my ear. And nobody wants that. Except my second wife, but that's a whole different thing. Give me a medallion on your neck. You got 90 minutes to return home. That ain't going to happen. And then Decker just stabs Frank Gordon in the belly, killing him. And yeah. then he, he cuts the rope that was connected to his wrist. So Gordon's body just falls to the ground and is going to be trampled by this parade of sadness. In right. <laughs> this caravan of people. And then Decker looks at Gerard Butler and the professor. Hey, I used to work for ITC and we read all your reports. I know who both of you motherfuckers are. Uh, by the way, did Doniger tell you how your DNA gets all fucked up when you time travel? Man, I knew this one guy, Pete. He went back and forth so many times, he started to piss out of his butt and poop out <laughs> his wiener. It was fucked up. I got a deal for you. A, you are not going back to the future. No. Oh, sorry. I mean, I, that's probably referencing a much better movie than this, but you know what I mean. Here's the deal. Here I am. I'm king shit. So if you make me look good, yeah. then I'll make you look good, but 
if you end up giving me the old crawdad, I'm going to make sure that you die early here. I mean, earlier than you normally would of rickets or any number of things that can kill you back here. This place sucks. I'm not going to lie to you. This is rough, but this is pretty much the best situation you could find yourself in where you at least got a guy like me that's going to be looking out for your six. I'll definitely keep an eye on you. I got to take being here. A few things you need to know. Chronic diarrhea. I haven't laid a turd in six weeks, all right? It's just water. Um, number two, if we do decide to kill you, there are crazy ways to kill you. Like, it's not just like pushing you off a cliff or cutting off your head. They'll kill you with, like, a bunch of spiders. It's fucked up, man. But for some reason, in the last three weeks, I climbed the ranks. And you want to know why? These guys are fucking stupid. They don't know anything. I am now the second in command because, according to them, I invented baseball. These people love it. I am maybe the smartest man alive. Gerard Butler, I know, was talking a big game earlier, but I'm the one who got this nailed down. I figured out how to make everybody here think I'm the biggest genius in the world. This Oliver fella, man, he don't do shit without asking me first. (laughs) He's always like, hey, Decker, what if I eat this mushroom? And I'm like, no, man, that'll kill you. I told them to quit eating rocks. They did. Half of them quit dying. I was like, shit, don't do that. I told them one day when clouds come in that are dark, I was like, oh, it's going to rain. They thought I was a fucking prognosticator of the future. They come to me and ask me all kinds of shit. And it's simple stuff. Like, don't eat maggots. Cook your meat. When I told them tadpoles turn into frogs, it blew their minds. Like, nobody had put that together before yet. When they get cut, they were pouring mud on their cuts. I was like, don't do that. Put water, cleaner water, not mud water. They're just fucking dummies, man. (laughs) Aside from the diarrhea, it's awesome here. It is until you get literally any kind of infection. This guy stubbed his toe dead in three days. Yeah. So I would say look out for any sort of ingrown toenails or aggressive pimples. Those could be your undoing. But aside from that... Running the show, man. Also, no air conditioning. That is a bit of a problem. Also, real quick, if you're going to hook up with one of the ladies, I recommend hand stuff only. Mouth stuff, vagina stuff, it's a roll of the dice, boys. You are going to get sores. The question is, how are you going to get those sores? And also, on a positive note, if you do decide to go with traditional relations, if you get anybody pregnant, infant mortality, 99%. You're not going to have to worry about raising that kid. You can raw dog it back here in the Middle Ages. Don't even worry about it. You really don't have a choice because the only thing they use for condoms is the same thing they use for sausage skins. (laughs) And let me tell you, that is porous at best. Fingers crossed, every kid that so far has been the result of one of my raw dogging adventures, dead on arrival. They're all dead. Yeah, they're all dead. So they take Gerard Butler and the professor and they throw him into this laboratory to make Greek fire. And remember, we have 90 minutes to wrap up this movie in characters real time. And here the professor says, I can't give the, the English Greek fire. That would alter history forever. And Gerard Butler says, look, I've already done that. I ran into that firecracker of hotness lady Claire, and I think we're in love or something. Hey, you know what? Fuck it. Just change history. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Yeah, he's really, really (laughs) gone off the wagon as far as, like, trying to protect the nature of space-time. The professor's like, wait, Lady Claire, isn't her death what caused the French to defeat the English? Uh, We've really cocked things up, especially if I give the English a weapon that can destroy the French. Hey, see if you can find some booze and let's just get pissed drunk. There is a bunch of cutting back and forth here where it's just to remind you as the viewer where all of these characters are at any given time. Uh Uh-huh. There's a quick cut to Kate and Paul Walker just looking for this tunnel. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I guess we need to go to the monastery. Oh, yeah, that's probably where Professor Dad is. And then we cut to French and English armies starting to line up against one another. The English, again, are in this castle, lining the ramparts of it. The French are lining up outside. With a bunch of full-scale trebuchets, which I think, though, the whole reason this movie was made was that, well, one, it was based on a Michael Crichton novel. But two, is that I just think Richard Donner and the filmmakers wanted to make this low rent Braveheart where they were like we're gonna build eight trebuchets and fill them with rocks covered in flammable liquid and we're also gonna build a castle and we're just gonna blow it up and like that sounds awesome I want to see that in real life and film it it is by far the coolest part of this movie is where you start to get a lot of of the practical 
trebuchet and flame effects and stuff like that there's very little special effects in this movie that i can identify it's all yeah. practical effects yeah and some of it looks pretty cool it's just a terrible movie with no characters or motivation or plot or point you know it's the old line about nobody left the theater whistling the special effects yeah. and yeah that's the problem is that nobody left this theater caring about the trebuchet stuff because everything else about the movie sucks Kate and paul walker make their way to this monastery they find their way into this tunnel this is where they find the piece of paper that the professor wrote on as well as his eyeglasses in a box and kate says we have to put these back so we can find it in the future which will make us come back to save your dad and mm -hmm. i was like i don't know that that's accurate but okay and then kate says hey there's that wall that was damaged in the future by some son of a bitch wait i was the son of a bitch who damaged it and i'm like what are you talking about you damaged it and then she just goes over and just starts smashing the wall and yeah. all of these monks are there and they're getting pissed off because she's destroying this beautiful piece of artwork and then as she smashes through it she needs paul walker to help out and as they bust through the wall there's a tunnel behind it right right so after all of this happens what the monks came in and reconstructed the wall that she destroyed later yeah, but did it real half-ass. Uh, all right. We get a cut to Billy Connolly, who is starting to dish out some of this Greek fire that he's made for Lord Oliver. And he's just like, please be careful with that. You'll kill us all, you morons. And Gerard Butler is like, yeah, they're very stupid, aren't they? Look at that one over there. He's drinking some of it. He's going to die. His entire colon is going to catch fire. Professor, watch this. Put some of that on your willy. It'll make it super hard. Oh, he's doing it. Oh. Oh, look at him running around and crying. What a baby. <laughs> One thing we left out is that when Kate starts to bust into this tunnel, she does tell the monks to go get Arnaud, the French commander yeah because found this tunnel and he's going to be able to sneak in yeah. and we cut to the actual battle which is like arno and all these french soldiers loading up these trebuchets and like we were saying it's the coolest thing in the movie is when they start firing these trebuchets at one another but it's still pretty boring it would be way better if you cared about any of these characters again if this were kind of the point of the movie but you sort of know what the conclusion of this is going to be but it's still kind of neat to see an actual trebuchet in action sure. i would recommend go watch youtube videos of trebuchets the pumpkin chunk and stuff yeah where people invent crazy machines to throw pumpkins <laughs> as far as they can that's probably more fun than this we cut back to itc headquarters in the present disrupting the movie's action much like those narrative transitions that you see in the assassin's creed game where you bounce from the past to the present doniger he's just given up hope that they can fix the coils allowing all of our heroes to return josh is there just crying about his friends because apparently they have the keys to the car and he doesn't have a ride home <laughs> kramer's trying to keep hope alive and we do hear that they have 28 minutes to get this thing up and running and all three of these characters just bitch and complain to one another so i'm like we have 28 minutes to finish this movie like tick tock so we come back to medieval times the english they create a fire moat to keep the french at bay that was pretty good and the, uh -huh. then there's a bunch of flaming arrows that get shot back and forth there's trebuchets and fireballs and whatever else and then the english they fire night arrows which means they don't have fire on them so i guess they're just regular arrows there's no need to dress it up as a night arrow we head back to kate and paul walker they're still crawling around these tunnels finally that monk shows up and he tells arnaud oh they have found a tunnel under the monastery you can sneak in the back door and he's like oh that sounds pretty good at this point my question is where is lady claire is she even in the movie because there are so many people and moving parts to the story it's easy to forget about them she is captured as it turns out but we'll get to her in a second because Arno is told about the tunnel. He takes some of his men and best archers to go there. Kate and Paul then, while that's happening, reach a dead end. And Kate does not handle this well. No. Where she just starts blubbering about like how she's <laughs> killed everyone. And... I killed a man. And now I'm going to get more people killed. Uh, I, I told you to trust me. And you did. And now you're going to die. And everyone's going to die. And my cats back home are going to die because I didn't leave enough food. <laughs> yeah so you want to do over the pants stuff or something 
Hey, it's okay. I've disappointed literally everyone I've ever met in my life. And they still let me sleep on their couches and <laughs> drink their recently expired milk. I can eat whatever food I want out of their refrigerator when they're sleeping. As long as I'm gone in the morning, they don't ever say anything to me. She is not dealing with any of this well. And Arno shows up and starts climbing through the tunnel as well. And you're like, oh, you are going to be very disappointed, sir. He gets to the end and finds that it's blocked. And Kate's like, hey, I'm really sorry about this. And he's like, oh, you're English? I kill you! Yeah, immediately just wants to murder them all. But we got to go back to the future for a second because Doniger and Kramer are arguing about saving all of these kids. We have 13 minutes left. I'm like, 13 minutes? What? Doniger, by the way, is using those 13 minutes to destroy evidence. Yeah. And Kramer is like, uh, what are you doing here, boss? Well, you know what they'll say. They'll say that this was all our fault somehow because we sent them back in time and then got them all murdered. So you're going to fix it because you always fix everything don't you i'm not fixing it this time you're on your own pal and so Doniger ends up shoving Kramer really hard. Uh-huh. And he falls backwards and hits his head. And I think it's a million dollar baby scenario. But he comes back later. But I agree. I thought he was dead. Yeah. Because he even gives it a Kramer? Kramer? So the other question I have about this is, like, there's no blood. But also, he's clearly tatered pretty good. Because nothing in this movie matters. He just pushes him over and he's like, oh, oh, I hit my head. Could you give me an ice pack or something? We cut back to Lord Oliver in the past, who now has Lady Claire captive, and he shouts out, either your brother surrenders, or we are going to hang you. And Gerard Butler is there, and he sees all this, and he says, Ugh, that's that wild child Lady Claire. I've got to save her. So he runs out and screams at Lord Oliver, Lord Oliver, release Lady Claire and bring her to me, or I'm going to take uh, this shield and this uh, torch, and I'm going to do something. And and then this is where Arnold uh, catches up with Kate. It is a trap. And then Gerard Butler decides that he's going to take this torch and chunk it into the armory filled with explosives, which he does. And this blast blows open a hole in the tunnel that is going to allow the French to infiltrate Castle La Rock. And then Arnold, he immediately changes his tune when it comes to this English woman. And he just starts kissing her. And then he kisses Paul Walker. You're like, oh, the French. The language of love paul and kate find billy Connolly, who are they are extremely happy to see alive they go up the back door into the castle along with the soldiers gerard butler runs off to save lady claire uh -huh. then arno and lord oliver fight two characters that we couldn't care less about sure but mm, i guess so they're <laughs> fighting each other and then Lord Oliver kind of gets the upper hand and Paul Walker steps in and starts fighting him and Gerard Butler and Decker are fighting. Everybody's fighting everybody. Paul Walker ends up kind of accidentally stabbing Lord Oliver, but Lord Oliver is not killed by this. Arno is the one who kind of lands the killing blow and kills Lord Oliver, who may be the villain of this movie, but he's only been in it about 10 minutes more than me. Right. So that seems... Uh, the professor and Kate, they make their escape as the French bust in to have this big battle. At this point, Gerard Butler and Decker, they're fighting hand to hand. And wouldn't you know it, Bo, during this battle, Gerard Butler gets his ear cut off in the battle. When this happens, there's a moment of like, ear cut off. Lisa needs braces. <laughs> ear cut off. Lisa needs braces. Ah, oh, because I got my ear cut off, I'm the guy on the sarcophagus and like popeye after sucking down a can of spinach gerard butler gets his second wind and he's like hey people hey, it's me i'm the knight who lost his ear i'm going to murder you dicker ba -da 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 clink clank swords and then he for the second time gerard butler commits murder or no third time he commits murder and kills decker and decker who again based on the number of times that he's traveled back and forth he's got all the palsies and multiple of the sclerosis he's probably got sickle cell and all of the cancers and bonitis so he was probably a pretty weak opponent when you really think about it after a few weeks or months back here in ye old middle ages his bones are brittle yeah. and he hasn't had a decent meal in weeks Kate and the professor run over to this field so they can travel back in time paul walker runs after gerard butler to get him to go with him and he's like hey bro let's 
go. It's time travel in time. That's my catchphrase now. It's time travel in time. Decker has your medallion. Could you get that? Because I think we might need it to time travel in time. The movie interrupts this action sequence to go back to the ITC labs. And Josh locks the door of the lab so that Doniger can't get in. And Kramer's nowhere to be found. So I'm like, what's Josh doing? I don't know. Like hitting the big red button, maybe? Just hanging out, hoping his buddies show up. I mean, a lot of question marks. I don't know how Josh understands any of this. Decker, by the way, is not totally dead yet no and wakes up long enough to ask to be taken home hey take me home tonight i don't want to let you go till i see like you know that song i fucking love that song man who play that at my funeral if you would Eck. tell him sir cruel's like this is my favorite beer i'm so close to, to draw my last breath here tell my three ex-wives i loved them i'm just trying to think what good last words are uh leonard skinner rules uh that smell um <laughs> every rose as it's thorns. Rock and roll eight noise pollution. Uh Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tank. <laughs> I can't drive fifty-five, man. My dingaling. My dingaling. I want to tiptoe through the tulips with you. And then he dies. Meanwhile, though, <laughs> Paul Walker is like, hey, Gerard Butler who may be my brother or something. I don't know. Hey, we're about to go home. You better run quick. And Gerard Butler is like, I'm not going, laddie. I am home. And then he and Claire make out in mm. front of Paul Walker is, oh, I get it. You like all the bows and arrows. Take my medallion, head back to the future, and make your own history. That's my catchphrase. Stop traveling time! <laughs> he just runs off. Doniger is trying to stop all of this in the future, so he runs into the machine. How did he get in? Didn't Josh just lock him out? I think he locked him out of the control room. Oh, so he runs up on the platform. Okay. Right. He's on the platform. Yeah. And then Paul Walker ends up joining Kate and Billy Connolly, and then they hit the marker, and then Doniger gets zapped. He zaps back while they zap forward. Is that how this time? machine works it's like a revolving door people come in as people go out he actually says as the mirrors or whatever close he's like oh i don't have a marker I, I don't have a way back which doesn't matter because when he goes back to the 1300s he immediately gets cut in two by an english soldier's sword like that didn't matter he survives for about 37 seconds you know what if that hadn't happened his family and their lineage would have dominated planet earth i mean he was the smartest man on earth in present day you imagine this dude back in the 1300s he would have been the billy Connolly. <laughs> so our three remaining heroes come back josh rushes over to greet them and he says where's gerard butler and my best friend francois and they're like oh they're dead he's like oh shit i'm glad you guys are here then we cut to the dig site and paul walker runs over kate just called they finished the sketch cavation on the carfacus let's go check it out so everybody runs up there billy Connolly Connolly and uh, the professor and Kate's there. And they've now brushed away the side of this sarcophagus, which I call bullshit that they wouldn't have done this much sooner. Uh -huh. And on the side of it, it's inscribed with this lovely story about Gerard Butler and his wife, Claire, and their kids, Jules and Vern, and the death of Francois and, and Gordon. Like, it mentions everybody. So if they had just swept this away and read that at the beginning, the movie never would have happened. Like, presumably, right. all of this was there when he was talking about the one-eared knight and Lady Claire in the sarcophagus, right? I guess. I mean, he was there was a, a carving of him with one ear. Right. So this inscription had to have been there, which if he had just read that, that would have screwed everything up. Again, it goes back to the predestination argument of, was all of this going to happen anyway because it could not happen because that's the way all of this unfolded. Like, you get into some weird time travel stuff yeah. based yeah. on this, but also the movie takes those moments to be like, no, 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 we can't take the glasses and we can't take the documents document because if we don't have those things we'll never come back and we have to come back so yes if they had brushed away the rock would that have already been there one presumes it would have had to have been i mean yeah. uh, anyway so paul walker then gets creepy with kate again and he forcibly holds her hand and paul walker says it looks like they made history together time traveling time it's like what he always said you gotta make your history by 
Time traveling with the French lady. There's no way these two are going to end up as a couple. The end. Kate is going to dump him for someone smarter within six months. Like a dog. (laughs) And that's it. That's timeline. Yeah. It is a dull, frustrating, overstuffed movie that somehow manages despite the fact that it's got all these characters running around doing sword fighting and trebuchets and saving the princess and saving the professor manages to be incredibly dull i agree it's a really 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 boring movie so this season we've had talking gorillas and we've had murdering robots and Uh, we've had time traveling archaeologists but let's say we change things up a bit for episode four and we discuss a buddy cop murder mystery with international intrigue i'm talking about 1993's rising sun starring perhaps the most requested actor on big six movies one mr sean connery pairing up with wesley snipes for his sophomore appearance on this particular podcast this can't go well it won't having seen this movie in preparation already i'm really interested to talk about it because this is a movie that is directed by paul schrader who's a a legitimately good director and it's a really bizarre movie which i'm excited to discuss in detail on this program and also dodge all of the hundreds of landmines in discussing this movie we've said this before but i'll say this may be the most racist movie that we've reviewed and i'm trying to think what the other candidates were wild wild west was up there wild wild west is very racist stay away joe was incredibly racist yes i know there are other racist movies that we've had but um those are the ones that leap out wild wild west is shocking but this movie is intentionally racist and it gets a a bit uncomfortable this movie reminds me of an episode of the tv show chopped where you open up the basket and it's like well what do we have in here i have all right we have film noir and i've also got japanese america international business relations uh ooh racism and then i've got a sean connery and i've got a wesley snipes make a movie out of that and also make sure that there is some kinky choking sex in it so weird and uh, if you can get all of that to come in right at two hours that's going to be perfect and that's what you get so come back in two weeks time and we will review whatever all of those things put together produce in the film rising sun as always like rate review you can reach out to us at pick six movies at gmail.com you can find us here and there we do our best to reply to everybody who reaches out to us but we do have lives and sometimes things get uh, a little bit uh, a little bit hairy but any final thoughts that you have on the motion picture timeline i think when i drink too much i go in the future time travel time we'll see you in two weeks time everybody we'll be right back